All right, now we are talking nitty gritty, three handed versus two killers. We got Nikki P, Nikki Petrangelo. We got Lucky Chewy, Andrew Lichtenberger, the Yogi of Poker, right? So two really well studied, top level players, and we're deep. We are very deep, and all three players. For a lot of the time, we sort of passed chips around, and we were pretty even for an extended period of time. So we're definitely in the battle. We're in the trenches. We're fighting hard. You know, ICM matters too, of course, right? Because every time you move up a place, it's a significant amount of money. As you know, I don't really care so much personally about the money. I'm always trying to win, but I'm conscious of it so that I know how to exploit others that are playing, you know, with that in mind, right? It sort of frees me up. Um because I'm fine with going broke, but at the same time, I know others aren't, so you can do some different things. Anyway, this hand is really cool, okay? It's really kind of a cool hand, even though it's gonna sound really wimpy. Petrangelo. Ace, queen off. Upstairs to 70 we go. Now two black jacks out of the big for Negreanu. We'll see how he proceeds. Blinds, 1530, $30,000 big blind Annie. Nick raises the button to 70,000, which is a little over a min raise. Yours truly has jacks in the big blind. So we three bet, right? Most of the time, most of the time. However, if you look at the chip stacks, you know, uh, me and Nikki kind of got a nice little cushion over Lucky Chewy, right? So from an ICM perspective, you would think, you know, you want to be a little more careful, but that's, that wasn't really a big part of my consideration. For me, it's the stack depths. We were pretty deep. And Jax is a good hand, right? But Nikki's a sticky player, okay? So he's going to call a lot. And now I'm bloating a pot with a strong hand that's vulnerable, right? So, aligned with what my whole thought process going in was, a little more small ballish approach in these spots, I didn't want to get into like a coin flip here with jacks against ace king. Because what if I, if I three bet jacks and he four bets? <laughs> what now? <laughs> Call and then hope to hit a jack? Uh, it's a little bit dicey. So anyway, I take the low variance approach. Well, maybe not. I wouldn't say it's the low variance approach. It's the uh, low risk approach. Well, that's sort of the same thing. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Okay, so now I just called, which disguises the strength of my hand too, right? So it strengthens my calling range, and that can be relevant. If you're playing three-handed for a long period of time, you don't want to be so polar where you're just three-betting all your good hands and then only calling with your kind of marginal junk hands because then if someone can construct your ranges like that, every time you just call pre, they'll just pound you because they know you can't have really good cards. Grano feeling very dialed in, choosing to flat and top set here. Against two overs in the Broadway gut shot. 185 in the middle. Petrangelo going for 65 into 185. Obviously, there's a nightmarish turn card for Daniel. That does lurk in the form of the king and a non-board pair, but as it stands, starts with a little slow play. So, the flop is pretty, pretty, pretty good. Jack-10-5, rainbow. I check, naturally, right? This is the spot I'm gonna check this board no matter what I have, right? So you're thinking, what was my range do? Checks, always. He bets 65,000. Now, if I have pocket fives here, I'm much more likely to raise. Why is that? Can you figure out why I'm more likely to raise with pocket fives than I am with pocket jacks? I'll give you a second. Huh? You figure it out? Did you figure out why? Okay, so the reason I'm more likely to raise with pocket fives than I am with pocket jacks is when I have pocket jacks, I'm blocking a lot of the calling hands, the top pair hands, right? So hands like ace, jack, king, jack, queen, jack, all that stuff. If I have two through two of the jacks, it's unlikely that he has a jack, right? If I have pocket fives, I don't block any of that stuff. So now I'll be targeting ace, jack, 
or, or over pairs and things like that, right? So with fives, I'm going to be much more apt to fast play than when I flop absolute top set. Even with middle set, I'm more likely to raise with tens. So most likely to raise fives, second most likely to raise tens, least likely to raise with jacks, again, because of what you're blocking. If there was a flush draw on board, maybe I'm going to raise a little more often as well because now I can represent some more bluffs, right? What you don't want to typically have is spots where you're raising on flops where it's you just do that with good hands and you never have any bluffs. When a flush draw is present, your check raises with strong hands are much more balanced if you're also doing that with flush draws or any sort of combo draw. Like if I had queen eight of hearts and it was 10 jack five with two hearts or something like that. Anyway, I decided to just call in this spot. Um, knowing that Nick, you know, he'll fire a second bullet with some bluffs. You know, he's going to try to get me off of like so the queen eight hand, the seven nine, a five, whatever the case may be. So he's going to bet the turn a decent amount, I think. Um, especially if he has nothing, right? Very clean turn for Daniel. Oh, yeah. No flush draws to be concerned with. Now the pot, we've got 315,000. Turn is a four. Well, I'm not going to bet this card now, right? You, it's like, if you're having a conversation, the conversation looks like this. Oh, you've raised? All right, I will call. Here's the flop. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Razor. Do what you're going to do. All right, I'll see that bet. Next card, be like, okay, Mr. Razor, it's up to you. Are you still going to bet? You wouldn't go, oh, the four? Guess what? I'm going to bet now. Just, it doesn't make sense, like, in conversation. It's an awkward sort of step, so you would never really bet this four. Um ever, right? So I check, and he checks back, which is disappointing, right? We much, we would much preferred a spot where he bets, and then we can elect to check raise or continue to slow play. Negreanu checks a second time. This time, Nikki P checks back, and the queen on the river does present an issue for Nikki P. We'll see whether or not the chips enter at Daniel's behest or Nikki's. Well, it's going to be the latter, if at all. Now, here's the river. The river's a queen, right? Who has range advantage on that card? I don't have ace-king, right? I'm never supposed to. I mean, in theory, I could because I'm playing jacks this way. He can have ace-king. He could have pocket queens. He could have two pair. He could have a whole bunch of stuff. He could have king-nine. He could have eight-nine, right? I could, too. I could certainly have eight-nine and king-nine. Probably not ace-king. And again, we're, very, we're, we're really deep. I'm out of position. I don't think this is a card that makes a lot of sense for me to just lead at, right? This is a card that if he does have nothing, let's say he has king three. If he has king three, and I bet maybe he bluff raises sometimes, but a lot of time he'll just fold. If I check and he has king three, he's going to bet. He's got to bet that queen because now he's going to try to get me off a five, a 10, and maybe a jack depending on what size he chooses, right? So overall... I felt like the best approach on the queen was to check, okay? Now, depending on his size, we're going to proceed accordingly, okay? If he bets very small, well, we have to raise. We have three jacks. If he bets medium, well, if he bets any large size or bigger, can we raise? Does it make sense to raise? And let's, let's break it down. So... Ace-queen sure. feels like a lot of hand. Well, certainly he'll be value-betting the ace-queen ahead of things like queen-eight, queen-nine, jack-x, ten-x, so on and so forth. 285. And I would think as uncomfortable as it may be, Daniel should raise here. Naturally, Nick has ace-king more than Daniel, but we see it is possible that Daniel has it, given the slow play with jack-jack. A raise targets things like ace-queen, queen-ten. Goes ace for queen. call, fair enough. Nick will see the, uh, that's a lot of hand there. Yeah, you're like, don't lose the minimum. <laughs> was a raise an option? I, I would have <laughs> thought it was for a choice raise and then just decide if you get piled on I suppose fold but understandably uncomfortable against a player like Petrangelo who might take some ace x and turn it into a bluff given that he has ace king a little bit more than Daniel but again given that they're so deep Daniel really could just call ace king off we move forward 
We check, he bets 285, which is almost the pot. Okay, again, we talked about that. That's a polarizing bet. That's, uh, you know, I've got a really, really strong hand or I got nothing. If he's got nothing, our raise doesn't get paid, okay? If he's got a really strong hand, you know what hands those can be? 16 combos of ace-king, 16 combos of king-nine, 16 combos of eight-nine. That's 48 combos that beat my set of jacks. Queens, nah, I don't really think so. I think he's going to bet his queens on the turn. So let's just assume, just for the sake of the, you know, the argument, that 48 total combos is exactly what has me beat if he's, if he's got it. If he's bluffing, again, it's irrelevant. Because if he's bluffing, he's not calling the raise. So, is there value in me check-raising if, if 48 combos beat me? Now you have to ask the question, all right, if I check-raise, say, to like 750, how many combos call me that are worse? All the bluffs fold, right? All the bluffs fold. Completely full. Am I bluffing here on that fucking queen? Excuse me for, excuse my French. Am I really going to be bluffing here at a, at a, at a good clip? I could have 8-9. I could have king-9. So if he has a hand like ace-queen, I don't think he's going to call a check raise. I really don't. So if he's not calling with ace-queen, which is like really the only hand that we beat because aces bets, kings bets, maybe maybe he checks back aces and kings some of the time on the turn, but I don't think so. I think most often he's going to bet those. So the question is, what am I targeting? Two pair? Queen-10? Reasonable. Some queen-jack? Sure, but even those hands, he's got to ask himself, all right, what does Daniel's range look like that just check called the flop, check turn, and now check raises river? What's the bluff? If I have a queen, I can just call. If I have a jack, it's a bluff catcher, it's fine to call. What hand am I turning into a bluff that doesn't have anything? Seven, nine? That's it? <laughs> so you're just going to hope that I got seven, nine? I don't think so. So when you do the math on this, it sounds, it seems really you know, wimpy and whatnot to, not, to raise, but I think raise would be a huge mistake, okay? Because when you are value raising, you have to be ensured that there are enough hands your opponent calls you with that you beat. And in this case, he's going to call me with 8-9, king-9, ace-king, all the hands have me beat. Maybe you make a case he's going to call with queen-jack, queen-10. There's not 48 combos of that, especially when we have all the jacks right? It's not, we could do the, you could count the combos if you want. You know, there's three, uh, you know, three queen tens, like the one queen, what is it? Well, you can't have the one. Oh, yeah, whatever. Four queen jacks. Anyway, it's not a lot, right? And it's a very ambitious check raise there. Too thin, I think. And it's funny because I spoke to Nick after his hand. He's like, yeah, obviously. Because some people might be like, oh, you have to raise. But he knew. He knew that I'm never raising here. Played a big pot with those jacks. Well, it could have been a lot bigger if I played it like a normal person. <laughs> I, I honestly, like, I don't even, I mean, like, I have so much ace-king. Oh, on the river, I'm not raising. I'm saying preflop. Oh, yeah, Like, I could have three-bet bet. bet. But was, on the river, why would I ever raise you? That seems insane. It's like, what's the point? That's yeah. like suicide. <laughs> I don't have ace-king, probably, so. Honest you question. you do, and then you're I little, fold the best hand. You're allowed to have whatever you want, but yeah, I wouldn't raise the river. Yeah, you know what I mean, though, right? Yeah. <laughs> Nikki P pops. Uh, but again, had he bet small, if he bets 100, well, that $100,000 bet represents a wider range. So I'm, of course, going to raise that to probably 350, 400. But once he bets the 285, the risk of the raise doesn't outweigh two things. Number one, it's just a lot of chips to risk three handed in this spot. And number two, I don't beat enough hands to the call, right? If he's bluffing, we win. If he's not, 48 combinations of cards he could have that have a speed. Now, you can discount some of the combos. Like, maybe he bets again with 8-9 or queen-9. Sure, but it doesn't matter because still, there's not enough. So, anyway, when you're thinking about a value bet or a value raise, ask yourself what hands will call you and how many of those beat you? How many of those do you beat? If more of the hands beat you, then don't then don't raise and don't value bet.